Hello everyone and welcome to Tea Time with Carson Bodie. I am your host and today we will be speaking with Kayla Wheeland, an artist and writer based in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Check the description below to find out how you can be featured in a future Tea Time episode. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy some tea. <laughs> can you hear me clearly? Uh, you're good. <laughs> okay, awesome. <laughs> First of all, it's great to see you. Yeah. In like a real live moment type of situation. Like this is cool. Right? Yeah, I know. I haven't done a lot of Zoom. <laughs> Honestly, same. I literally was on a Zoom, I want to say two weeks ago. And then after that, like not at all. Yeah. I'm just going to grab the tea. It's behind me. Hey, what's up, you guys? It's Carson. And today I am here with. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I probably should have mentioned that you should have said something there. Yeah, okay. I'll be ready. ready. <laughs> my fault. Hey, what's up, you guys? It's Carson, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. And in today's video, I am here with... Hey, I'm Kayla Wheeland. Let's go over a quick, brief history. Kayla Wheeland was born on September 4th, 1987. She currently lives in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and is a stay-at-home mom. She has two degrees in graphic design and painting and drawing. She, like me, is terrible at video games while the rest of her family loves them and is passionate about abolishing modern day slavery, which we're going to talk about because I think that's really fucking cool. She finds creative inspiration from anywhere and is currently writing a riveting novel about a young girl who is seemingly lost with everything, but through rumors of sorts, discovers a whole new perspective. There's more to it than that, but I'm going to let Kayla talk about that. So did you end up seeing the results of your tea time poll? I did, yes. Um, so I have a sweet cinnamon spice. And you have Ooh. cinnamon too, right? I have apple cinnamon turmeric, voted on by everyone on Twitter. Go follow yeah. us on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought it'd be fun since you always do a poll. I figured I'll do a poll, that way I know what tea I'm drinking. So yeah. I saw that and just got so happy. I was like, okay. I just felt like it was needed. Like <laughs> it calls for it. Now we're having tea time. Like, yeah posh British ladies, except neither of us are British. <laughs> neither of us are British. And I'm pretty sure my mug is too big for that. <laughs> yeah, I think this this is a little too big for that. I literally yep. brought this from work. It's my new work mug that oh, I nice. had at work for three days and brought home solely to do this interview because purple aesthetic. I have, I don't know if you can see, a little purple in mine too. So oh, that's really cool. I actually have a friend who has a mug very similar in design. Is, is it like a handmade mug? Like it so is. Um, so my professor in college, my um, pottery professor, used to make a ton of mugs. And so if you took any of his like photography or pottery classes, you always got a free mug at the end of the class, like when it was finished. So I think I have like four or five. <laughs> I took all of them available. <laughs> That's the best type of university class though. You like, you go to class and you get mugs afterward. I would be so down to do that. Yeah. And like, I don't use any of the mugs I made because I don't actually trust the handles to hold up. True. <laughs> so true. mugs are trustworthy. <laughs> yeah. Most of my mugs are clear glass and it's like, mm, no, nah, I don't yeah. trust you. So let's start off with some questions. Um, okay. How long have you lived in Grand Rapids and have you ever been to the Grand River? I have lived here since 2014, so coming up on seven years now. Okay. Um, is that right? Yeah, coming up on it, I guess. Um, Grand River, yes, I have. Oh, cool. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> where did you live? <laughs> Where did you live prior to Grand R Grand Rapids? I almost said Grand River again. Oh, that's okay. Um, so we we lived in Indiana, um, in like a small town, Indiana. My husband and I met in college there, and so we just got married and we lived there for I can't even think of the time right now, but years, and then decided um, we were going to move. So we moved up to Michigan, and that was supposed to be temporary, but we're still here. <laughs> six and a half years later so <laughs> it is what it is I know it's like with Michigan the, the places I know most of ironically is that I know Grand Rapids it's it seems pretty weird yeah. that that's the the part I know about Michigan but yeah there's I mean Michigan is the Grand Rapids area is really cool they've got a lot of like arts um they're really big into the arts which is really fun 
uh, I can't, their art prize every year is so fun. I love walking around and seeing all the different things that other people create and do. Um, but yeah, I don't know much other parts of Michigan. I'm not originally from here, so I never really explored much. Last fall, I went up to, oh man, my mind is blanking. I went up like northern part of Michigan with some friends and um, my husband and I went up to the UP once on like an anniversary trip. But, the UP? Like, other, upper Peninsula, sorry. Oh, okay. I guess that kind of be the same thing as me saying the Canadian Shield, which nobody knows what yeah. the heck that means anyway. So it's no big deal. I mean, yeah, you pick up a lingo when you live in certain places. That's so yeah. true. How was the college and university experience like for you? Because I don't know if you saw my video. I had a pretty rough university experience. Yeah. So I was wondering what advice you would also give to anyone who wanted to pursue an arts degree. Oh, boy. Um... <laughs> I went to like a private college. So it was a smaller college, which was really nice for, um, you know, the walking part of college, like walking to campus, like walking through campus was nice. Um, so that aspect was really nice for me, I thought. Um, the arts program, I loved my professor. <clears throat> um, some of the arts professors were just, they were, I mean, they were artists. so. I'm just gonna blanket the statement and say that a lot of artists are were just a little weird sometimes and they fit that profile and I love them for it because I felt like I could relate to them um, on that weird, I'm gonna say random things and it's gonna be okay <laughs> kind of level. Um, but it was difficult, private colleges are more expensive so I don't recommend them, especially when you don't actually have a job that you use your degree for. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of fun. Um, but my, my college experience was good. I made some really good friends. I, like I said, I love my art professors. Um, I met my husband there, so that was good. I feel like you get more of a, if you're going for art, a more well-rounded art education, maybe at a um, public university, a bigger university, or a more like art-centered university. So. Mm -hmm. Because I went to a university called Ryerson. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of it, but it's kind of known as like the high school of universities because yeah. they have like lockers there and it's like, it, it looks like a high school. And w everything was great about the the program and the, and the artists and everything. I felt like for me though, there was, with all art schools, I find that there's a lot of pressure to make something that is fitting the ideal of, either a company or a professor or something like that. Did you ever feel like type of pressure when creating art for your projects or something like that? Some of my, some of my classes, I, I'm sure I did at the time. There were other times though where like um, my painting and drawing classes, I did not feel that way. I felt more free to do what I wanted. It was kind of like, find something you want to paint and do it in this style or do it in this, like not even style. Like we could do basically whatever we wanted on any kind of large scales. But the the graphic design classes, I felt more, I mean, it's preparing you for a more commercial type of, I don't know. I did not enjoy those classes, I guess. So I maybe have blocked out some of that in my mind. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's the classes where I actually learned how to like create that I remember the most from university yeah. and not the ones where it's like, here's how to be a business-minded person it's like oh lord <laughs> yeah I wish I would have retained a little bit of that but no it's mostly like I remember the art techniques that I enjoyed and you know I, I personally found that I learned more about like the business side of being creative more after I left university and just from like personal experience so yeah. I guess there's different ways people learn that kind of stuff but you yeah. mentioned that you met your husband at college and I believe life is full of lessons if we look at them that way. So how did you and your husband meet? Like, like what's the story behind that? And what lessons have you learned from that relationship and just motherhood and all of that? Uh, oh, boy. Um, so we met actually um, a friend of mine in college liked his friend, <laughs> basically. And so the two of them... And us, we had like a mutual friend between us. So he had invited us to like a movie theater. So a bunch of us girls went, 
met them. No one was introduced to anyone. And that was that. Like I was, I did not really know anything about them. The next night, um, since it was a private college, they had like open dorms. You couldn't just wander into the boys' dorms and they couldn't just wander into the girls' dorms. Um, Mm -hmm. We had special nights where we could do that. So we were invited to go to the guy's dorm. Um, And so we all were going to watch a movie basically there. So again, we watched another movie all together. No, I still didn't know who he was. It wasn't until after that, that we were like hanging out on campus and like we actually introduced ourselves. And then it was kind of like every day after that, we would just hang out. And um, my friends described it as a giant polka dot elephant in the room that he and I liked each other. Elephant wasn't enough. It had to be like polka dot. I'll take um, it to the next level. <laughs> Yeah, it was, like, super obvious, I guess, that we liked each other, but, like, we never actually, like, talked about it or, like, spent a lot of time just the two of us. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was, like, a slow, like, friendship to relationship kind of a thing, and so, yeah, I mean, we're both just kind of weird and in our own way and nerdy, so, Um, but, yeah, being in a relationship for so long you learn I've definitely learned like as much as I wish sometimes that he could read my mind and I could read his like it's not gonna happen (laughs) so um I've learned to better communicate what it is that like I need or I'm feeling or all these kind of things and I feel like he's done the same and I mean that just goes with parenting and motherhood too like trying to teach your kids like just tell me what's wrong. <laughs> I felt that in my tibia because I, yeah. I like my last, I'm not even calling it a relationship. It was a situation. We were horrible at communicating. That was like the one thing I learned when I had to walk away from that was just like, you have to communicate, be able to communicate with the person. And if you can't communicate with the person, like what else do you have really? It's like, you need that in trust. Like it's just, it's a, it's a needed thing. Yeah. And it's super hard to say, Hey, like this is not right. Or this is how I'm feeling. It's taken me, you know, almost 12 years now to even still, sometimes I'm like, eh, I'll just hold on to it for another day or two. And <laughs> I always regret it. Um, it's just super hard to get to that point of like being able to open up right away, I guess, on things. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I personally relate to that a lot because I tend to hold on to at least for a day now to kind of yeah. get the emotion out of me. Because I'm like, if I come at this emotionally, I'm going to say something stupid. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> you're yeah. not, oh. the I said it all. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> all right. So this next one's kind of long. So give me a second. In the pre-interview questionnaire, you said, I believe in making fair trade purchases whenever possible, which can be difficult because the cost is typically higher And so I do my best. I worked in a fair trade store for a time and I was able to see products that people were making as a way to provide for themselves and their families and to be free from the slave industry that we were in. I'd love to hear more about your journey discovering this passion and maybe offer some tips to viewers about how they can make an impact in abolishing modern day slavery. Yeah, I would love that. Um, So yeah, I first learned about um, modern day slave trade um, back in college. And it just like, it kind of rocked me because um, I don't know how it is in other parts of the world, but here in the US, a lot of times we're told that like slavery is abolished, it's over, there is no more of it. Um, And so like finding this out was kind of like this major eye opener, like it's not true. And I still hear people say like, oh, we have no more slavery here. And I'm like, we do though, like in our country, in the Canada, in all of these countries we think it's gone from, it's still there. Like there are um, like 50,000 people um, who are trafficked into the US every year. Um, And like, these are estimated numbers, I feel like, because not all of these are detected. It's, it's hard to, um, it's hard to detect. It's hard to find. It's not out in plain sight anymore. It's hidden and secret and um yeah sorry that's okay Uh, like this is this is interesting and like hearing about this is like 
I don't know, it brings me back particularly to, I remember when a YouTuber by the name of Brittany Louise Taylor talked about her experience in her book, nearly being trafficked by her abusive boyfriend. And it was just, it was eye opening to me that like someone in the public eye could even be going yeah. through this. So it would not surprise me if it was even more people who were subjected to this and it, it it's sickening. And it's all over. Um, um, I, I learned about this and I started working for a local artist while I was in college and um, I talked to her about it and like she had known about it and it was something that we kind of, I mean, she's one of my closest friends now. Um, and she, so years later, she contacted me. She was working for at a store that sold fair trade goods. And come to find out, like they not only sold fair trade goods, but they would travel to other countries, um, work with these women who maybe were trafficked or maybe were in like rough working conditions, helped them to like make jewelry, help them design like jewelry and different things. Um, and then, you know, they'd ensure that they were paid a fair wage for their products. Um, and then they bring back, back the products. And so what my job was, was I basically got to see all the products and that was um, inventorying them and um, tagging them for the store and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, like that, when you're seeing things coming in daily, like it, it's eye opening, like all the different countries. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of organizations, um, even here in the uh, the U.S. there's um, OUR, which is um, our Underground Railroad. They work towards um, helping to find traffickers and um, free, um, like a lot of women and children who are in those situations. Um, there's Agave International Missions who work on that. They're in, um, I know they're in Cambodia and I maybe a few other countries near that. I can't think right now, but yeah. Um, fair trade products. I love them. They are pricey sometimes. They're worth the price because you know the money is going towards someone who really needs it. And those costs are going towards school for their kids and food for their families. And it's going into their communities to help um, these communities grow and keep building. Um, so yeah, actually the necklace I'm wearing today, I wore on purpose. Um, oh, if you can, I can this, see it. Yeah. Yeah, these beads are made out of, I want to say like cardboard. Um, so yeah, these are like handmade beads. I forget what country they're from, but um, this is from Trades of Hope, which is an organization that sells um, jewelry and home goods products made from women who have been brought out of like brothels and different trafficking situations. Wow, that that's incredible and yeah. great, great on you for wearing that and like showing that, like physically showing that. And I'm gonna link everything that Kay like all the organizations that Kayla just mentioned in the description. So if you guys want to go check that out, you for sure can, and I encourage you to do so because yeah. modern day slavery is not not cute. That's that's the least I can say about that. <laughs> um, yeah. So I always, like my coffee and my chocolate are always fair trade. <laughs> like those things nice. are like, like, those are easy to find, you know, anyway. Okay, noted. <laughs> <laughs> so like pivot on conversation, um, your Instagram pictures, they're incredible. And I wanted to ask what inspired you to create your images, whether it be the ones with your kids in the books spra sprawled out or just like your paintings, like, is it inspired from like keeping a theme or is it more so just like your own creative licensing or what, what's really the inspiration behind it? So for a while I was, I was had a bit of a theme in like my grid so that um, like, as you would scroll, you would see like in you know, the middle or whatever column, it would be like a stack of books and then a artwork. So it was kind of like, piece like that and I've kind of broken away from that I finally decided I needed something I needed to change it up but um the book art that I do is just kind of like I see other people doing it and so I try to create something that others aren't doing like I don't want to copy it um so I'm tr but it's super hard which is why I don't do them very often but yeah, I try to find fun images to do. And it was, lately it's been inspired by like, okay, like what would my kids think was fun to see laid out? Because they're always awake when I'm doing it and usually watching and I'm usually like stand over there so I can't see your shadow and <laughs> things like that. Um, 
but yeah, I, I have to share my art on there too, because it's just, it's a part of who I am. I like sharing that. I like creating little stories to go with some of the pieces as I've been doing like lately. So yeah, I've been trying lately just to share more of like my writing and my art with a little bit of books and what I'm reading mixed in. It's really cool. And I guess this kind of answers the next question I have, but I'm still going to ask it. Does your visual art impact your written work or vice versa? And in what ways? Um, yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, yeah. And stop. Thank you. <laughs> I was yes, it does. Um, sometimes what I create inspires like, me to write something to go with it like uh just recently I posted like a planet that I painted for fun and the little poetic uh story with it um that was really inspired by the painting it was just like I'm just gonna write this and it's super fun now other times I'm just inspired by like I just really like space and stars and the moon and stuff like that so some of my poetry that I've been writing lately is a little bit more inspired by that and so it's kind of inspired me to paint more of like outer space and planets. So they've, that's just one example where they've kind of like meshed together. One inspires the other, inspires the next and so on. Yeah, I, I read that piece and I loved it. I also loved in your story, you had a little rocket on it and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Is, is that rocket part of the piece? And it wasn't. I was like, it works with or without the rocket, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's that good. <laughs> the rocket was just fun. <laughs> Loved it. I'm also I've been inspired a lot by stars and like the moon and the sky and everything. I mean, the, literally the last two months of prompts both included a star prompt. So yeah, I, I definitely relate to that. So you've been posting some poems and character blurbs related to your book. And um, based off the pre-interview questionnaire, I'm already sold on the book. It's something that I can relate to and... It's kind of similar in theme to what I'm working on with my own book. So I got a few questions about it, sure. particularly about Raven. You've yeah. been posting a lot about Raven. And when I think of the name Raven, I think of the bird and the symbolism for ravens, you know, loss, insight, prophecy, bad luck, etc. Does Raven, the character, reflect those symbols? And does symbolism play a role in your writing? Oh, absolutely. And I chose the name raven particularly because of some of those meanings of what the raven means um so yes it does play a part in like that's not necessarily why she was given that name but it does kind of represent who she is as well as being um just kind of a lost soul where you know she's just gone through a lot of tragedy and she's working through this and she's fighting um for vengeance and she's fighting for the this her found family. And yeah. What, how has writing this in a quarantine been? Cause I know for me, it kind of kicked my ass into gear to say the least. So I don't know how that might've affected you because it definitely can affect people differently. Oh yeah. So I did NaNoWriMo, which if you don't know, it's National Novel Writing Month for anyone who doesn't know that. Um, <clears throat> I did that in 2019 and I actually wrote, I got just over 50,000 words of this book written then. Wow. Um, yeah, it was my first time doing it, but I had spent all of the, like January through October, basically preparing myself for this book um, with research. And I like to call my first draft um, my notebook, which is just like kind of chocked full of like notes of like, the characters, who they are, conversations, random scenes, literally one page probably says they have to go here. Like this just random notes I would write. Um, and so then December, January, 2019, 2020, I finished writing it. And so all last year was <laughs> don't edit a book during a pandemic. That's all I have to say. It was terrible. Um, yeah, I I was really hoping the book would be finished like last summer, like completely done. And last summer is when I decided to rewrite the whole thing, which I did. And now I'm still like trying to edit and revise and yeah. 
again, I can relate because I finished writing the first draft of my book in July. And then I was like, you know what? I'm not done writing this yet. There's still a lot I need to say. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, and, and I'm reading through it again. And I'm, again, like I'm changing things about it. Like, like nah, I don't really like how this is worded or no, like this person didn't do that. I don't know. So yeah, I'm still working through it. Well, so then my next question is uh, going to be an interesting answer. Do you have a release date in mind? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Um, no. So right now I'm about halfway through the first section, uh, which is about 12 chapters. Okay. Which I wish I could tell you how much that really was because 12 chapters could be really short, really long. But so I'm working through that part right now. And then I'm hoping to get some readers to read through that section and give me some feedback on it as I, you know, move on to the next segment of the book. Um, yeah, I'm still aiming for some point this year to have it finished um, and then figure out the next steps after that. That all sounds great. So uh, my computer is telling me that my battery is going to die. So it's a good thing we're on the last question. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what is one thing you want to say to the viewers at home watching this, whether it be about anything we talked about, anything extra you may want to include or something about the book. I will tell you what I keep telling myself, which is like find whatever it is that you love doing and find a way to do it. I've been creating stories in my head since I was a little kid. It's just what I do. If I space out on you ever in a conversation, I'm probably in a story in my head. And it's not your fault. It's something struck me and I can't get it. I can't stop it. And it took me this long to actually decide to try to write a book and to really pursue writing it and hopefully publishing it. So I don't know, just keep, keep going, keep fighting. I don't know. That's what I'm trying to do for myself is just keep, keep working on it. Oh, that's, that's so nice. I feel like I needed to hear that too. Oh my God. Keep going, Carson. <laughs> you keep going too, Kayla. I will. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for doing this and taking time out of your hectic day to, you know, speak with me. If you guys want to follow Kayla, which I highly recommend you do, I'm going to have links to that in the description box down below. Thank you again, Kayla, for coming on and yeah. sharing your story and everything. Um, and that's pretty much the video. Make sure to give it a thumbs up, comment below, share this video. If this goes well, then maybe we'll do more episodes in the future, more frequent uploads from me, you know, that kind of thing. We'll see. And um, that's the tea. See you guys next week. Bye.